Welcome, dear Emoji. How are you this evening? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine and glad to be here with you. It's always a pleasure and an honor. And Likewise. The sermon uh, that we'll be discussing today as he stirs up the people, excuse me for that uh, uh, miss, misspeak. And this sermon is uh, in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King, which this weekend is the uh, actually the holiday it will be Monday, January the 15th. And this weekend is the weekend that most people are celebrating. You use for your scripture, Luke 23, verse five, he stirs up the people from Galilee, even down to this place. Would you provide maybe a little more context uh, for that scripture and how it applies to the sermon? Well, the, the scripture is the charge that the um, religious establishment, the leadership, religious leadership, the Jewish leadership, uh, that they took the Pontius Pilate and it's what they charged Jesus with, which was basically charging him with sedition uh, or revolting against Rome. Um, they, they didn't have any authority to uh, crucify Jesus. And only Pilate had that authority as, as the head of the Roman government in Judea. So they took Jesus to Pilate and charged him with stirring up the people, with causing, uh, causing people to uh, be inspired, to be incited, to stop cooperating with Roman control and domination. And so they, they, they charged him with the charge and basically they were declaring that Jesus was a dangerous person. He was a revolutionary. He was a troublemaker. And they were right. He was. He, and because what he was advocating was certainly dangerous to uh, the status quo. And I, I use that scripture because it relates to the same kind of situation with Martin Luther King. Um, Martin Luther King was nonviolent, but he was actually dangerous to the American social order, to the American status quo, because the things that he was calling for, the indictments he was making and the things that he was calling for, the changes he was trying to bring about would be a, a, a fun, cause fundamental change in American life. And so uh, when they declared him to be an enemy of the state and he was eventually shot, it was because it was pretty much the same conditions Martin Luther King stirred up the people too. Okay, and I, I, um, I as we get into the uh, conversation, it'll become more and more clear about this danger and how I actually kind of came to this idea of similar to the John Lewis that this is like a good danger, like good trouble. Good trouble, yeah. So to speak. Uh, I enjoyed your reference to your experiences with Drs. Jeremiah Wright and Reverend Jesse Jackson and their discontent with how uh, Dr. King has come to be portrayed. Handled by gatekeepers. Uh, and this, that they felt that not only his body was assassinated, but his legacy was also assassinated. Why do you think leaders like King and maybe Malcolm X and others images or once they're safe in the grave, so to speak, are uh, liable to be or likely to be assassinated in this way? Could you maybe elaborate or excuse me, just, you know, the image distorted or, or appropriated may be a better way, a better, more appropriate word. Well, I think it's because they are dangerous, because they are popular, because if you really understood what they were about, if you understood what Jesus was about, if you understood what Martin Luther King was about, if you understood what Malcolm X was about, they are dangerous to the status quo. And so the scholars and gatekeepers move right in and try to redefine and soften and to make uh, to make a more accommodating message, a message that uh, can be slightly critical, but something that they can... Uh, say that they've gotten beyond and the pro they've solved these problems 
and look back and talk about how we got over when if they really dealt with the meat of their message, it would be dangerous all over again. So any anytime um, you're committed to something in a total kind of way, you're you're dangerous to the status quo. And and so there is an effort to uh soften. Like I said, they 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 defanged him. They they took they took the bite out of what he was saying and doing and the kind of uh, real threat that he was to the social order is kind of watered down. I also like a comment you made about how they talk about King or reference King like he was one of them or vice versa. Yeah, I mean, uh, Republicans introduce all these these uh, uh, unfriendly bills and they start off with a quote from Martin Luther King all the time. Um, as if the quote, they, they use Martin Luther King's quotes the same way people use quotes in the Bible. You take it out the Bible, out of context, and apply it to whatever you're trying to do whether it's right or wrong or good or bad, you can use the quote because it gives more authority to what you're putting down. And more people like us, men and black folks, will listen thinking that that lends credibility. Right. Well, in the sermon, and I, it was very clear to me, hopefully it comes across clear to others, but part of the reason we do, do this is to help add clarity. You made three major points. Uh, referencing King's strategies and or accomplishments. One was he broke the fear that was the key that maintained white supremacist, this white supremacist order. He orchestrated confrontations that exposed the ugly, brutal, cruel, evil nature of American racial discrimination and oppression to the world. He effectively strategized to put pressure on the government to pass landmark civil rights legislation to ensure full citizenship for black people. Why was this important at that time in terms of for King to do what he did? Is it important now? And how are these accomplishments or are these accomplishments relevant to Black people today? Well, they're absolutely relevant. And I think in what I was trying to do was if Martin Luther King's legacy had been redefined or softened, why would that be? Like, what was it that he actually did that doesn't really come across in all the celebrations that we have uh, the people uh, uh, reenacting speeches and having speech contests and all of that it, it never really comes across what did he believe in and what did he do uh, what made him dangerous um, so that he had to be assassinated and so I said the first thing he did was the whole the, the whole um situation in the old south of Jim Crow was held together by fear. It was held together by the the, the, the threat of you being killed. Uh, and so that is what maintained the order. And Martin Luther King broke that broke that fear uh, by uh, standing toe to toe and eyeball to eyeball with uh, with uh, 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 the powers that be and and winning it changed black people so that they were we stopped being afraid like afraid to the point that we were paralyzed to do anything and mm -hmm. and with the montgomery bus boycott he won uh in albany the the children actually even came out of the schools Basically, what he was saying is, if we if if we're unafraid and we stick together, they can't kill us all. They can't put us all in jail. Mm -hmm. They're gonna have to come to some accommodation. And the basic problem is that we're cooperating with our oppression. That's relevant because that is true of us today too. We have not learned that if we work together and we're not afraid, that we can force concessions and changes that change our reality and accomplish the uh, 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 reforms that we want to accomplish in society to make us full citizens treated in a decent kind of way. So that, that, that lesson has, we learned it for a little while. And then when we got sucked into the American dream, we forgot it all over again. 
So we need constant reminders. Yeah, you need a reminder in every generation. Mm -hmm. And the second thing about uh, orchestrating demonstrations, you know, it, it, it's, I never, was, I was not a king person at the, at, at, at the time mm -hmm. that he was actually alive. Uh, and shortly thereafter, I was a Martin Luther King person. It's because I really didn't understand what he was doing. Uh, most people of my age that were, of the militant ilk were um, dissatisfied with his uh, passivity and nonviolent philosophy. Um, but we didn't really understand what he was doing. Mm -hmm. He was uh, uh, creating confrontations that uh, kind of made America look bad on the international stage. Mm -hmm. And because he made America look bad, on an international stage at during a time when America was vying for uh, superpower status with uh, the Soviet Union, the countries in uh, the third world that were breaking free from colonization, they were, they were gonna align themselves with one side or the other. But Martin Luther King's strategy of making the United States looked bad in the eyes of the world meant that it was actually affecting the United States' ability to be a, a superpower with allies all over the world. It, it was affecting their status and it actually, it was aiding the, the Soviet Union. So they had to they had to back off these overt, embarrassing uh, images on TV of black people getting bit by dogs and water holes down the street and beat in the head. They had to they had to change. They had to change the overt violence and act like they did have some kind of uh, they had some kind of sensible policy when it came to people of color. So he was using that strategy and gaining concessions and having laws passed uh, on a regular basis. And it was quite effective at it. Okay. And um, of course, there's so much more to ask and it's so engaging. One thing that you said that I think was very poignant is you said when you were that age, you didn't really understand King. And it was young people like uh, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, who kind of rejected King's perspective and that's when you get a shift from civil rights to black power so i just wanted to add that in but i'd like to ask you one last question as we wrap this up in your concluding remarks you explain quote in this world it is our duty to be dangerous like mlk to stir up the people from galilee even down to this place until justice rolls down like a river and righteousness like a mighty stream how do the programs of the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church facilitate and or help Black people to operate from this perspective? Well, we create, an, we create another model. We create another side. Basically, we are in the business of consciousness raising, which that's really what stirring up the people is, is it's consciousness raising. Because once people's consciousness is in a certain state, they're no longer in the fog of believing that um, they don't have any ability to control their own destiny and can start making decisions and moving in directions which changes things. They stop being under the control or under the spell of the system and start making different decisions. So stirring up the people is actually freeing them from their kind of con uh, con control programming. And it's starting to see actually what the reality is and making decisions based on their interpretation of reality. So it's a... Uh, um, it's a, a, our program is raising consciousness. The unveiling of a black Madonna raised consciousness. The institutions and the programs we operate, they raise black people's consciousness. The, the, the uh, institutions we build, the, like the Beulah Land Farm, it raises black people's consciousness. It also gives us a, the ability to determine our own future, to control our own reality as we grow out these programs and institutions. 
But all of that has the, the effect of people outside of us of raising consciousness, where people start to say, if they can do it, we can too. If they, we don't have to accept uh, life as it, as it is being prescribed to us. We don't have to accept the limitations and the indignities and humiliations that we have to put up. We don't have to accept our rights being stolen. We can work out alternatives if we are not afraid, if we work together, if we uh, uh, have our consciousness elevated to the point where we see another path. And I think that stirring up the people, like Jesus didn't build anything. Uh, he didn't uh, um, have any programs or any institutions, but what he, what he did do was he opened the eyes of people. And I think Martin Luther King, same thing. He didn't build anything, but he had people to begin to see that they were not uh, locked into the uh, world they had been programmed into, that it was possible for changes to be made. And if they were willing to fight and work together, that things could be done. And so I think that's the basic, the basic value uh, that we have to the world today is that we've plot another path and show an, another direction and that we can be self-determining, that we can work together, that we can um, we can define ourselves and defend ourselves and uh, um, educate our own children uh, in, a, in a way where it serves our interests and not our oppressor's interests. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for this conversation and uh, what I think is a very powerful uh, sermon in a very uh, revolutionary interpretation of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, particularly and, and most relevant to the times we live in today. We'd like to also thank our, our viewers for viewing another episode of Afterwards. This is a discussion where we engage in dialogue with the presenter of our weekly sermon presented by the Lakota which is one of the many programs of the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church. Bila Kuta, be, excuse me, Bila Kuta is Church Without Walls. We urge you to join us again in our upcoming afterwards and future sermons, which are broadcast live on YouTube every Sunday morning at 11.30 a.m. We urge you to like us and share our broadcast broadly across, across all social media platforms. You're also invited to join us in our best self uh, movement. You can also contribute to our movement as well. You can find more information and contact us at shrineonline.org. Thank you very much. And we ask that you stay safe and we'll see you again. Thanks.